Good afternoon, you way bastards, and welcome back to War Thunder with Koala. And today we're talking about the newly announced Operation Summer event for this year, which is actually named Operation Heat. Probably because I hear it's been absolutely mad hot across a lot of the Northern Hemisphere this summer. Yeah, I'm a pasty white Scotsman who lives in Australia. <laughs> Let me know when it hits 46 Celsius, then I'll be impressed. Now, this operation is not another one of those unlock the parts slash pay through the nose on the marketplace, build a bear kind of events. Instead, starting August 2nd, you'll simply complete tasks in order to earn coupons, and then you just spend those coupons on vehicles. No need for marketplace shenanigans. I'm sure this is how most people prefer it. It definitely is how I'm preferring. I despise the I-180 crap that happened earlier this year. I completely gave up on that. But I do know that some people did enjoy the building tank style, so this news will be unfortunate for all three of you. This year we're getting not four, but six unique vehicles, given that there are now two new naval rewards. But in this video, I just want to go over the dev blogs for three of the new vehicles, two tanks and one aircraft. This is because these are the specific vehicles that appeal most to me personally. I mean, I could go on about the naval forces reward vehicles, I just don't find them myself to be all that worth covering, but we've got a couple of bits of strangeness to go over with some of these vehicles too. Firstly, the BT-7 F-32, which will be a rank 2 Soviet light tank available upon completion of 5 tank based tasks. The tasks themselves are pretty standard fare, get assist per match, kill a certain number of enemies, win a certain number of battles, really they should be pretty easy, especially if you're in a squadron, so I don't doubt that even a lot of you casual scrubs will be able to unlock even the more costly reward vehicles if they're what you're focusing on. The BT-7 F-32 is, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a BT-7 cruiser tank prototyped with the F-32 76mm gun. This is obviously very similar to the F-34 gun seen on some of the earlier T-34s, and given that this BT-7 F-32 will be a Rank 2 vehicle, this one is most likely going to get the scouting ability, unlike the regular BT-7 or BT-5, or even the T-50 light tank at battle rating 2.7, and of course none of the T-34s have it. This is actually a vehicle that somebody brought up on one of my recent videos. If you haven't been keeping up with the channel, I've got a little playlist going on full of suggestions for light scout vehicles and armoured cars that could be added into the game, and the most recent episode was on options for Russia. Now, I didn't mention this tank specifically myself, mainly because I didn't actually know it existed, it just slipped under my radar. Uh, but it did exist, there are photos of it, I'll try and put one in the video. Honestly, I don't know how this one passed me by when I made that video last week. Now, we don't have this exact gun in War Thunder as of right now, but what we have to compare it to are the two 76mm guns on the Rank 2 T-34s, the L-11 and the F-34. The F-32 is slap bang right in the middle of these two guns in muzzle velocity, penetration, etc. Which means it's probably just under 100mm max pen, and if we're lucky, this tank will get access to smoke shells, just like the T-34-1941, which has the very similar F-34 gun. Given the speed of the BT cruiser tanks, and the fact that this tank will most likely get the scouting ability, Gaijin does refer to it as a scout, I'm assuming this tank will sit at battle rating 3.3, possibly as low as 3.0, given its lack of armour and ability to be hull broken very easily, especially by the German 75mm guns, which are often slugging heat rounds at you. The BT-7 F-32 never ended up going into serial production, despite it being highly recommended as a standard upgrade for the Soviet Union's existing BT-7s, of which there were a lot. Now, one thing I have a problem with when it comes to this tank, and not even with the tank, but with the dev blog, is that Gaijin specifically suggests taking this vehicle into much higher ranked battles as a tank to rush capture points and accrue easy spawn points for aircraft. All three of these things happen regularly, of course, but none of them, in my opinion, should be encouraged. There's this unwritten rule in tank battles, at least there used to be, that when the capture points are lined up 1, 2, 3 and a line between your spawns, that you wait at your team's closest cap before capturing it early game so that allies can share in the spawn points and your team overall can field more tanks on the battlefield. What Gaijin is suggesting is that you should do the exact opposite of this, rushing the cap and stealing all the capture points for yourself, and essentially this means that they are actively discouraging teamwork and selflessness. Great job, guys. <laughs> 
Actually, if you didn't know, Gaijin's basically already removed this tactic, because it used to be that you earned a certain reward for capturing a zone regardless of how many tanks were in it when it was capped. What mattered was how long you had been in the point while it was being capped. Well, Gaijin literally decided to nerf teamwork, and rather than giving a set number of spawn points to each player who capped, capturing the zone now shares the SP among each player in the zone, so if there are two of you in it when it gets capped, you only get half the reward each. Three of you, then you get a third each. Four of you, only 25% each, dependent on how long each of you has been in the zone. But you get the picture. You're waiting for your teammates before capturing, you're going to earn pittance compared to what you would if you were the only tank rushing the capture point, jumping in there first, not waiting for anybody on your team. This is honestly one of the stupider decisions Gaijin has ever made, and I can actually say that with a straight face. One thing Wargaming has always done better than Gaijin is promoting team play in their games, but Gaijin, who already don't do this as well, decided they'd actively discourage and even go so far as to punish this level of coordination even further. <sighs> Of course, the other rewards for capping of Silver Lions and Research Points are also nerfed per the number of players in the zone. Please, for the love of all that is good, Gaijin, <laughs> reverse this change and stop suggesting that people forego teamwork in order to steal all the points for themselves. We're already fighting against our own teammates for kills half the time. Stop encouraging it. <laughs> The next vehicle I want to go over is the American Rank 4 jet fighter, the P-59A Aerocomet. Yes, you heard me correctly. Rank 4 jet fighter. Stonks. <laughs> really, this doesn't matter too much. The rank is just representative. All it changes is what you can efficiently research with this jet. Players will be able to use it to research Rank 3 aircraft if perhaps they're newer to the game or haven't progressed that highly in the aircraft tech trees, but you'll not be able to use it to research Rank 6 jets, which is a bit of a shame. Gaijin's basically saying that if you want an aircraft that can research efficiently all the way to top tier, then you're going to have to pay, but I guess that's fair. What matters more, however, is the battle rating, and it's not going to be that high. It's going to be a tier 4 battle rating. The P-59A era comment was your standard Bell aircraft during World War II, not really that well liked by the US Army Air Force, but unlike the piston-powered Aero Cobra, the US weren't forced by circumstance to actually use the damn thing. The Aero Comet was designed to be the first jet-powered fighter aircraft in the world, which obviously it never succeeded in holding that title, but it began development back in 1941. The aircraft would feature the British-designed Whittle turbojet engine, and Britain would receive one of the completed aerocomets in return for one of their Gloucester Meteor Mark 1s. The aircraft was designated P-59A, or at the time XP-59A, in order to give the impression that it was tied to the actually unrelated Bell XP-59 project, a prototype pusher-powered prop fighter... Prototype pusher-powered prop... Try saying that five times fast. Similar to the XP-55 Ascender, and this aircraft was never actually built. A funny story, but the XP-59A actually had its first flight accidentally, as it became airborne while taxiing the day before its scheduled first flight in October 1942. Numerous problems with the airframe and engine meant that the P-59A was not ready for mass production until 1944, and by that time many piston-powered aircraft matching it or even outclassing it in performance, such as the P-51 Mustang or Bell's own P-63 King Cobra. Bell then decided to cancel the project in favour of producing the King Cobra, and only a small number of 20 aircraft was placed for the US Army Air Force. Two additional P-59As were sent to the US Navy for evaluation under the designation YF-2L1, but these were very quickly judged unsuitable for carrier operations. Some further 30 aircraft ended up being produced in the end, bringing the grand total up to 66 aircraft built carrying the name Aerocomet. None of these lasted long in service, however, being replaced by the P-80 Shooting Star, and several were used as stationary targets or static display pieces, which can still be seen today. The Aerocomet was... 
a poorly designed aircraft. Although interesting aesthetically, with the engine nacelles being part of the fuselage, something unseen for the time, the aircraft itself was riddled with issues of stability and controllability, evidenced by the fact that it took off from the taxiway accidentally, and the performance of the aircraft was abysmal compared to other jet-powered designs, the 262, the Meteor, etc. Of course, you can give it some slack for that, being designed to enter service as a jet-powered fighter aircraft before any other in the world, but it lacked performance severely over its main competitors, the Gloucester Meteor and the Messerschmitt 262. It was deemed very slow by test pilot Chuck Yeager, achieving well under 700 km an hour maximum speed, and had a decidedly poor responsiveness. Because of this, War Thunder pilots can look forward to a nice low battle rating jet in the P-59A, something America doesn't have yet. No higher than 6.3 and possibly even 6.0, which will make it the lowest battle rating jet in War Thunder, at least so far. Given that P-51 Mustangs were known to outperform this aircraft not just in mobility but in straight line speed as well, I think this is definitely feasible and it would make sense given that the aircraft will be going into rank 4 rather than 5. This fact might make the Aerocomet interesting to use, as regardless of performance statistics, jet aircraft do fly noticeably differently to props, given their penchant for achieving their greatest engine performance characteristics while at the upper ranges of their speed. Props are the exact opposite. However, Matchmaker might prove the death of this aircraft, as rank 4 aircraft around this battle rating like Griffin Spitfires, Tiger Cats, Bearcats, and the P-51H5 Mustang, all of which will dance all over this thing, and all of them rarely avoid being matched up against some nasty German jets already. Still, it is an interesting design, it looks pretty cool, I mean, look at the size of those wings. Chunky bastard. <laughs> it's equipped with one M4 37mm cannon, just like other Bell aircraft, and three 50 caliber machine guns, and should have access to some rockets and bombs as well, making it good for tank battles. Hopefully the aircraft does get a battle rating of 6.0, as that'll make it perfect to use with my M41A1 Walker Bulldog, a tank that I absolutely love. It does set an interesting precedent, however, of having a jet aircraft below rank 5. This is the first time we've seen this. Does that mean that perhaps the HE162 and Yak-15P that sit at a battle rating of 6.3 might move down into rank 4 as well? Are we going to eliminate that wall between prop and jet-powered aircraft? What about the TU-4, which sits at battle rating 8.0? Is it going to move into rank 5? And does this herald the arrival of hybrid-powered aircraft like the Ryan Fireball, which was powered by both props and jets? What about much more modern close air support aircraft like the Embraer Super Tucano, a prop-powered aircraft, but with some real nasty weapons options, including a variety of missiles? What about the turboprop-powered TU-95 Bear, a bomber people have suggested might be a potential rank 6, which even though I don't think it would work in the current game, it must be on Gaijin's list of things they want to add. That was a lot of questions, and I want you guys to let me know your thoughts on this down in the comment section below, it opens up some pretty interesting discussions. While a lot of the Bell Cobras ended up being exported to the Soviet Union, because America really didn't like the things all that much, the P-59A Aerocomet never really took off at all, pun intended. The British felt decidedly duped, knowing that they'd swapped one of their far superior Gloucester Meteors for such a piece of trash, but in War Thunder, it'll be nice to see how it performs if it sits at a tier where it sees down tiers to fight Tar 152s and BF 109s, G-56s and the like. It'll definitely be interesting to fight against high tier Japanese props in this aircraft. It's available upon the completion of 10 aircraft tasks, of course we skipped over the 5 task reward aircraft, a model of the BF 110, fitted with an early iteration of the German 30mm machine cannon. Now the last vehicle I want to discuss today is the 10 task reward ground vehicle, the AUBL 74 HVG or high velocity gun which is a rank 5 Italian armoured car developed in the late 1970s and has a very interesting armament. The four-wheel tank destroyer developed by Fiat originally housed the 90mm Cockerel gun which was shared by the British FV-101 Scorpion, but the anti-tank capabilities of this gun were not deemed satisfactory for the Italian armed forces as it had no ability to fire armour-piercing rounds, only chemical energy projectiles. Thus, in the early 80s, a new turret produced by Otto Malara was fitted which housed the brand new 60mm high ballistic anti-tank cannon. This gun had the capability of firing an armour-piercing fin-stabilised discarding sable shell, which is interesting 
given how small it is. For those of you who may not know, a sable shell is basically a very small shell fired out of a very big gun. But this gun isn't very big. <laughs> now, there are smaller guns that fire APFSTS, of course, the A10 Warthog's 30mm Gallade Avenger fires APFSTS, but those are auto cannons, or even Gatling cannons, and this is a manually loaded 60mm. I doubt it will have a very long reload, a 60mm shell isn't exactly going to weigh that much, but it's no Bradley or Warrior or something. The whole purpose of using a sable shell is to pack a whole lot of explosive behind the shell casing, but only having a small aerodynamic penetrator actually fly through the air into an enemy tank. And if you want any more information on how that sort of thing works, then please go check out this video I made some time ago with Maximus. But a 60mm gun isn't capable of housing a large amount of explosive. Because of that, the shell isn't going to have very high penetration values, almost certainly under 300mm, and that's actually what has me worried. See, in the light tank and armoured car series I've had going on, I've suggested some reworking to the current scouting mechanic to make it much more potent, and therefore raise the battle ratings of each vehicle able to use it. But unless those types of reworks and buffs come, scouting itself isn't a much of a benefit, and because of that, I expect this vehicle to sit quite low in the battle ratings. The AUBL or Orbel we have in the game has 300mm of penetration on its 90mm heat FS, and it performs very similarly to the RU251, faster on road, but much slower off, and it sits at the same 6.7 BR, although already both of them should be 7.0. But with a 60mm APFSTS? I mean, it won't pen much, but it is an APFSDS round, and I really do not want this thing to sit anywhere below 7.7. .7. That's already the battle rating of the lowest vehicle with access to APFSDS, the Object 120 Tehran, the Russian Premium, which is already far lower than it should be. Seriously, Gaijin, 8.0 at least, if not 8.3. But that's a 152mm APFSDS slug, and this is a 60mm long rod they're going to be very noticeably different, and with the Tehran already being at 7.7, .7, I'm very worried that this tank will be put at 7.3 or even lower. I mean, it's a 1980s vehicle, this thing was produced after the M1 Abrams was adopted into service, the M1 IP was already being worked on when this tank was, but at a BR like that, it'll face a substantial amount of... Well, even World War II vehicles like the IS-3, the Mouse, the King Tiger, Pershing even. All I can say is, <laughs> goodbye armour if that is the case, and if you saw my video on the Tiger's battle rating decrease, you'll know that I already missed the days of a strong armour meta. So the implementation of a vehicle like this, although it is exactly the sort of thing I've advocated for in my Scout Vehicles suggestion list, I am worried about it coming right now, without the buffs to scouting that I brought up. By the way, if you want to go see that list, there'll be links on screen and in the description. With those scout buffs and an APFST shell, regardless of low penetration, this vehicle would actually make a good, hell, even 8.3. But without them, it really does worry me that Gaijin might balance this thing up quite low, comparing it to the existing AUBL and the Object 120, and using those two to justify a 7.3 BR. If that happens, it'll be an absolute blast to play, but I will loathe the thing. <laughs> Regardless, it's a 100km per hour armoured car, and we'll be hoping for side shots anyway. It'll be a good light scout vehicle, obviously zero armour, it's about as sturdy as the egos of G-Squad right now. I'm shit-talking as a joke so that you guys can laugh at this whole drama thing that's going on right now rather than rage about it. Seriously, I, I don't want any part of it. I just make light of it so that you guys can hopefully laugh at it too. The Orbel 74 HVG is once again available for completing 10 tank tasks, and given that I've been advocating for the introduction of more armoured cars into this game, it is going to be interesting to see and play. Just please don't give us more APFSDS fighting World War II tanks, Gaijin. Shit's dumb. <laughs> anyway lads, that's going to do us for today's coverage of the Operation Heat vehicles. Obviously I've skipped over the other three, the BF-110 and the two unique ship rewards. There's the British River Class Frigate, basically a bigger and better Flower Class Corvette, but not as large as the Destroyer, so that will be somewhat interesting to see. And the Japanese Shiratsu U Class Destroyer, the Yurachi. 
I'm not completely indifferent to these vehicles, it's just that Naval Forces has such a small player base and small viewership here on YouTube, but there is one more thing I do want to talk about. These tasks, which begin on the 2nd of August, by the way, I don't think I mentioned that yet, are much easier and more fun to complete in a squadron. Of course, the game in general can be a lot more fun when you're playing with a squad, not just because you avoid looking like the forever alone guy. Boy, that's a prehistoric meme. <laughs> but you also get a lot more tactical and strategic gameplay, and with these tasks, a lot of them require kill assists, or winning games, which is difficult to rely on random teammates for that type of thing, but very easy to coordinate when in a squadron. Seriously, just a two or three man squadron chatting with each other in Discord or TeamSpeak can just about win every game they play, and a four man squad of skilled players all coordinating and working tactically and strategically together is damn near unbeatable, regardless of how bad the rest of the team might be. With that being said, it's time for the self-plugging portion of this video, so if you're not interested in that, switch off now. I actually just uploaded a video today playing some top tier tanks in simulator mode with some of the lads from Albon Squad. Yeah, that's right, double upload, how special. Double War Thunder upload too, what is going on? It's almost like I have a schedule. Albon, or Dion Albanach Squadron, which translates to the Scottish Guard, is my personal War Thunder Squadron, and I'd definitely like to get some more of you lads involved in it, so if you want to join Dion Albanach, then make sure you check out the link below to my Patreon page. Yes, yes, I know. You sell out mother f Actually, it was more that this was a suitable reward for the Patreon tier system, but if you support the channel on Patreon, then you can be invited to join Albon Squad 2, as well as some various other benefits, like special roles on the Koala Tree, my Discord server, or having your name in the credits at the end of my video, so that everyone can see what a brawl lad, or lass you are, can't forget you Lexi, for supporting this high quality channel. Yeah, I just did that. Of course, your support goes a huge distance in helping me make these videos to make them better and get them out more frequently. Seriously, if I could upload five times a day, I would, and I want to thank all of you lads who do already support me for supporting me. I didn't think that line through. So if you want to join in, especially while this event is going on, as well as throwing your support at me and accessing some very nice rewards, then go down, hit the link in the description and check it out. I can't wait to have you lads join. It's going to be brawl. Anyway, now that we've got that absolute sellout plugging done, that's going to do us for today's video. I hope you have enjoyed and that if you did, you'd leave a like, subscribe and hit that bell icon, join the 360 squad as well as Albin squad, and let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. What do you think of the new vehicles? Which ones are you going to go for and why? Come follow me on Twitter and Twitch, join our Discord, Patreon supporter or not. Seriously, we just hit a thousand members on the Koala Tree, which is amazing and of course check out patreon or hit that join button here on youtube if you do want to support me further thank you lads all so much for watching have a lovely good day and always remember keep your bagpipes to hand keep your kilt on and i shall see you next video i say a wee thank you to these lads for supporting me on patreon Captain Fubar, DA261, Geesley Gadarson, and Dark Recon. You lads are bra. If you wish to join them, come check out the link in the description below. Thank you.